Heavenly Father, we love you. We appreciate all that you've done. and want to reciprocate everything you've done in our lives by listening to you, by embracing your word, by believing your word, by obeying your word. I will pray, Lord, you give us the utmost honor, respect for your word and for your person. And as we come to study your word, your heavenly word, your saving word, your sanctifying word, your holy word today, we pray, Lord, you grant us that sobriety of heart and that willingness of mind that your word will be priority of our lives in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray that all our response to your word, all our response to your teaching, all our response to the revealed gospel coming from the heart, a sober heart, a saved heart, a sanctified heart, an obedient heart, a humble heart, a subdued heart. Lord, we pray our response will be acceptable in your sight in Jesus' name. Make us reasonable, make us righteous, make us responsive to every word that you speak to us, even tonight in Jesus' name. Here and in all the other places where your word will come, I pray that every one of us will reverently come before you, quietly soaking in the word of God and being benefited by your word in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Another amen. Tonight we come. All of us, children, youths, adults, men and women, believers, those who have been coming before and those who are coming for the first time, we come to study the Word of God. And when we come to study the Word of God, we come with all our attention. And we come with all the submission of our heart, like our children at school, they study the subjects that will help them only on earth. And they give all their attention to that for the studies that will benefit them only on earth. We come to study what will benefit us on earth and in heaven for salvation and for qualification for heaven and for a life of reward, a life for, for joy and reward in heaven. If our children are youths, teenagers, if they pay attention in their secular school and subject, how much more? How much more that everyone, adults, fathers and mothers and their children and every member of the family will give the honor and the submission to the word of God that we hear that the word of God and our Lord and his word will not be just like ordinary people or even less than the ordinary. That's how we come today, the teacher of the word, the hearers of the word, all submitting to the word of God. Today we come to Galatians chapter 2. And we're studying from chapter verse 1 all through to verse 10. God bless you as you open your Bible there. Galatians chapter 2 verse 1. Then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and two Titus with me also. And then in verse 2, it tells us, And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, both privately to them, which were of reputation less by any means I should run or had run in vain. Look at verse 3. It says in verse 3, But neither Titus, 
who was with me, being a Gentile, a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And then in verse 4, he tells us, and that, be, and that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privily, privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Verse 5, to whom we give place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Then he tells us in verse 6, but of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it make it no matter to me. God accepted no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. Verse 7. But contrarywise, when they saw the gospel of the circumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. Then in verse 8 it says, For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And then in verse 9, And when James and Silvers and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me. They gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. Then in verse 10, only the words that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forged to do. That's what we're studying today. You'll discover that the gospel is mentioned in a number of verses there. And today we're looking at earnestly contending for the unchanging gospel of Christ. Passionately, wholeheartedly, with all our heart, with all our skill, with all our mind, with all the backbone we have, with all the grace of God giving to us, passionately contending for the unchanging gospel of Christ. In every message, contending. In our lifestyle, contending. In our teaching, in our preaching, Anywhere, everywhere, earnestly and passionately contending for the unchanging gospel of Christ. Against the usurpers, against the perverters, against the corruptors, against the false preachers in the land, in any land. Earnestly contending for the faith and for the gospel, and for the grace, and for the goodness of the revelation of God revealed in Christ, earnestly contending for the unchanging gospel of Christ. Three things we're looking at. Number one, consultation for the foremost preachers of the gospel. Number two, commitment to the firm preservation of the gospel. Number three, confirmation by the faithful pillars in the gospel. Number one, number one is consultation with the foremost preachers of the gospel. Look at verse two there. Galatians chapter two, verse two. And I went up by revelation 
and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach. That's the consultation. He went to those who have been in the gospel, in the ministry. Before him, he went to them. Those who had seen Christ face to face before Calvary, at Calvary, at the resurrection, after the resurrection, and they had heard the gospel from Christ before he died, after he rose from the dead, and he spoke to them about things concerning the kingdom of God. He went to them, he said, and I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I shall run or drawn in vain. What he meant is, I believe I'm preaching the truth. I believe I received this revelation directly from God. I believe I am telling the people, showing the people, the Gentiles and the Jews, the true saving gospel of God. But should I be mistaken? Let me go and consult. Let me go and compare. Let me go and communicate that gospel that I've been preaching to others who are preaching the age before me. That the consultation, consultation with the foremost preachers of the gospel. Look at three things here. Number one, the precise content in the preaching of the gospel. The real content of the gospel, whether by Peter or by Paul, by John, by James, by those early apostles and him who had just come into the faith. The precise content in the preaching of the gospel. Number two, the purposeful communication with prime pioneers of the gospel. The purposeful communication. He didn't just go there to, you know, communicate and to tell what he had been preaching. He wanted to know he had a purpose. Am I right? Am I like them? Do I have the original gospel? Do I have the vibrant gospel? Do I have the life transforming gospel? Lest I shall run in vain. The purposeful communication were prime pioneers of the gospel. Number three, the personal concern of present preachers of the gospel. Like Paul, the apostle was concerned whether he was doing it right or not. Which you personally, the work we do, is it according to that which is written? The word we preach. Is it according to that which was written? Look at three things here. Number one, in the precise content in the preaching of the gospel. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, reading from verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, the gospel, the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. You are saved, and you stand. Verse 2. In verse 2, it says, By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory. If what you have heard, the gospel, the saving gospel that leads us to repentance. The saving gospel that brings conviction. Conviction of sin that leads to confession and that leads to conversion. If you keep that in your mind, in your heart, in your spirit, if that abides with you, you keep in memory that what I preach unto you unless ye have believed in vain. 
There's the possibility of preaching in vain. There's the possibility of believing in vain. And he said, except you have believed in vain, keep to the gospel. Look at verse 3 there. In our tells of the gospel, for I delivered unto you first of all, that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He didn't just say, yes, I got revelation. He got revelation. But Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. Verse 4, and then he says, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to to the scriptures. Look at Luke chapter 24. In Luke chapter 24, reading from verse 45, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Verse 46, and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day that the gospel he died for our sins was buried he rose again for justification he rose again that the power of resurrection might come upon our lives and we will live according to the word of christ but it begins with repentance. Look at verse 47. In verse 47, and that repentance and remission of sins. If anyone is going to be saved, a child, a youth, a teenager, somebody coming from the outside, someone within, someone outside, if anyone is to be saved, if anyone is to go to heaven, if anyone is to escape, the perdition, the punishment, and the darkness of judgment forever. There must be repentance, and then there will be the removal, forgiveness of sins. It should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Acts chapter 20, reading from verse 20. In Acts chapter 20, verse 20, how I kept back nothing. That was profitable unto you. But that what I've showed you and I've taught you publicly and from house to house, what did he show them? The gospel. What's the gospel? Verse 21. Testifying both to Jews and also to the Greeks, both to people of my nation and people outside my nation, both to the children of Abraham and the outsiders who were Gentiles, heathens, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he tells us in verse 24, in verse 24, he speaks about the suffering that goes along with the preaching of the gospel. But he said, the suffering apart, that one means nothing just for this life. It's a light affliction. But now, his commitment to that gospel, every time, everywhere, but none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that... I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus, look at this, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. The gospel of the grace of God that we are not saved by works. We are not saved by being a good Samaritan. We're not saved by religious activity. We're saved on the basis that we know that Christ died on our sins, on the cross of Calvary. And then because of that, we turn, 
for repent and believe on the Lord who has said, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. Lest any man should boast. And we are his workmanship. Those of us who are transformed and converted. And we come to the Lord that now we lay according to the word of God. It's the gospel of the grace of God. That's the content of the gospel. Look at number two here. Number two, the purposeful communication with prime pioneers of the gospel. It tells us in Galatians chapter 2 verse 2, it says, And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means, any carelessness, Lest by any means any self deception, lest by any means any error, any falsehood, lest by any means, although running and sweating and suffering and preaching the gospel, he wanted to check out that the purposeful reason he communicated the gospel with those who had been before him he says lest by any means i should run or i run in vain in philippians chapter 2 verse 16 holding forth the word of life the word that brings people to life spiritual life resurrection life a mighty irresistible life a life that brings others who will see them to conviction holding forth the word of life that i may rejoice in the day of christ that i have not run in vain neither labored in vain that was his purpose he said studying the bible great preaching the word great traveling to philippi and corinth and colossae and all the other places great but what the result of what was done there and what is being done in all those places he wanted to be sure he had not labored in vain that should be our purpose too as a minister in a local church, in a district church, in a group, in a stage, in a region, everything you do as a witness in your community, that all your labor, everything you preach, inviting people to Christ, inviting people to repent and to turn to the Lord, the final consideration you should have is what fruit Am I bearing? Do I have any converted life to show for the work I am doing? And does the same gospel I preach, does it work in my life? As I expect that gospel to work in the lives of the other people, lest I run in vain. Colossians chapter 2, reading from verse 8. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy of vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Then in verse 9, it says, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. It says the gospel is to direct people to Christ for whatever need they may have in their lives because in him, in Christ, we have all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And then in verse 10, it says we're complete in him for salvation 
it's in him for living a new life it's in him for righteousness the righteousness of faith it's in him for our healing it's in him for deliverance it's in him anything we are anything we want to be anything we want to do the power the strength that comes all in him for ye are complete in him if then you go outside christ looking for any power outside christ looking for any possibility of living a better life and you abandon christ you run in vain your preachers run in vain and the apostle would have run in vain he wanted to make sure of the purpose of his preaching the word and he accomplished in him which is the head of all principality and power first thessalonians chapter 3 verse 5 for this cause when i could no longer forbear i said to know your faith i said to know your faith lest by some means the tempter have tempted you our labor be in vain the apostle paul was always concerned how are we running are we running in vain are we laboring in vain are we preaching in vain is the word taking root and taking effect in the lives of all the people we're preaching to at this stage do they have the evident life of transformation that we expect from those who are saved do they have the genuine faith the faith that saves he wanted to be very sure so he sent timothy to them in thessalonica to find out that those people were brought out of darkness into the light are they remaining in the light do they still count their salvation the ticket to heaven do they count that as the number one priority of their life are they keeping the faith lest our labor be in vain i pray our labor will not be in vain your pastoral work will not be in vain your witnessing your soul winning will not be in vain your labor and coming to the church and coming to study and deny yourself of this this and that i pray on the final day it will not be in vain in jesus name we come to number two now number three rather personal concern to the present preachers of the gospel it tells us in mark chapter 7 reading from verse 7 how be it in vain do they worship me teaching for doctrine the commandments of men what do you teach as a preacher present day preacher of the gospel what do you pass around you see the people sent to you is there gospel there and they say pass it on to other people pass it to they say at least 10 other people when it gets to those people pass it on pass it on is christ the center of those messages does it demonstrate reveal the death the burial the resurrection of jesus does he talk about repentance and faith in christ jesus does he show if any man be in christ because of christ he is a new creature old things are passed away and behold all things are become new or are you the carrier of their secular and psychological and good samaritan messages pass it on pass it on 
you're running vain because all you're doing is passing on the doctrines and the teachings and commandments of men. In verse 8, it says, but leaving, laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things ye do. Verse 9, it says, and he said unto them, full well, ye reject the commandment of God, the gospel of God, the gospel of Christ, the gospel of grace, that ye may keep your own tradition. It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, reading from verse 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 2, by the which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. How do people believe in vain? Verse 33. In verse 33, be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Verse 34, it says, Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God, the gospel of God. They have not the gospel of grace. They have not the gospel of Christ. I speak this to your shame. It tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, reading from verse 1. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. Ye receive not the grace of God in vain. In vain. That should be a personal concern, a personal consecration that the grace of God, which has brought salvation to my life, teaching me to deny ungodliness and worldly laws, that I should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, that that grace of God will not be in vain. It's in vain when you do not deny worldly lust, worldly tendencies, worldly character, worldly behavior, worldly resistance to the word of God. The grace of God will be in vain in your life when you cannot deny worldly lust, when you still remain and abide in the same corruption like the corruption in the people who are not born again, you receive the grace of God in vain. When you do not live righteously and godly and soberly in this present world, in your office, you're a joker like the rest of them. You're frivolous like the rest of them. You're dubious like the rest of them. You are deceptive and false like the rest of them. And you change receipts like the rest of them. And you write and report lies like the rest of them. You receive the grace of God in vain. The Lord wants us to check up and wants us to be concerned that we have not received the grace of God in vain. Look at verse 3. In verse 3, it tells us there, giving no offense in anything, whether in church or outside the church, in your family or in your community. Giving no offense, you're not offending God in your character, in behavior. You're not a careless, flippant person. The grace of God has worked and wrought something definite in your heart giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed 
James chapter 1 verse 26 in James chapter 1 verse 26 if any, any man among you seem to be religious and bright let not his tongue controls not his tongue subdues not his tongue tames not his tongue and bright let not his tongue but deceiveth his own heart this man's religion this woman's religion this boy's religion this girl's religion is vain you want to make sure that as the grace of God has appeared unto you it's bearing fruit and that your religion is not in vain your tongue can betray you words of anger words of slander words of deception words of violence words that generate fraud all those things betray you that your religion is vain verse 27 pure religion and on the fault before God and the Father is this to visit the fatherless and widows in the affliction and to keep himself unspotted, unstained, undefiled from the world. Point number two now. Point number two is commitment to the firm preservation of the gospel Galatians chapter 2 reading from verse 4 and that because of false and that because of false brethren unawares brought in who came in privileged uh, privately to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ that they might bring us into bondage we were free free from lying free from deception free from our old lifestyle but some people were brought in into the workforce some people were brought in into the house fellowship system some people were brought in uh, into the ministry and then they become popular conspicuous and they want to bring us back into the bondage of sin they want to bring us back into the bondage of denominational religion that has no salvation that has no purity of heart, that has no pure conscience, that has no life that is lived above sin, that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privately, secretly, surreptitiously, to spy out our liberty and freedom freedom from sin, freedom from worldliness, freedom from evil. They come to spy the freedom we have in Christ, which we have in Christ Jesus. And they are laboring day and night that they might bring us preachers and believers, might bring us ministers and members into bondage. Then in verse 5, Paul the Apostle said, To whom we didn't look at their faces, at their position in society, at their power, at their connections, to whom we gave place by subjection. No, not for an hour. We didn't so forget ourselves that in a moment, in an hour of carelessness, in an hour of joy, happiness, we forget ourselves, and then the false brethren 
come in, let the pollute the church and defile the church and they bring in evil. He said, no, not for an hour. Why? That the truth of the gospel might abide, continue, take root with you. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the corruption and condemnation of false brethren. Number two, the courage for conservation in faithful believers. Number three, our consecration and continuity were focused boldness. Number one, the corruption and condemnation of false brethren. Those false brethren, what did they try to do? Number one, they proclaimed themselves as brethren. Number two, they hid their falsehood. But anyone that knows the truth, anyone that looks at their lives, anyone that looks at the results of their activity will know that they are not true brethren, they are false brethren. What did they do? Acts chapter 15, verse 1. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren, and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. They were diverting the attention of the converts from Christ to Moses. And there are people that will direct the attention of people away from Christ to so and so their own Moses, to such and such, their own Miriam. And what Moses says comes above what Christ has done, what Christ has said, and what Christ has effected. They lift up a man, whether the man is among you there and is called by a particular title, they lived above a woman, whether the woman is among you there, called by title, and they exalt what that man says. If they go against the gospel of Christ and say, oh, my friend, look at the gospel, they said, brother so-and-so said, that brother so-and-so has replaced Christ in their understanding. Those are the false brethren and the people they are pointing to, if those people challenge them, uh -uh, I told you to do this, you're doing another thing. You know? are, you, are you claiming to know the Bible more than me? And you say what the Bible said. Are you quoting the Bible to me? I am so and so. That's a false pastor. That's a false preacher. That's a false minister in our church here. He wants to exalt his own authority. And whatever he has said, or if he's a woman, whatever she has said above the doctrine and the gospel of Christ, they want to bring us back into bondage to a personality. And we say, no, not for an hour will not give me enough to that. They said, except you are circumcised. With the circumcision of Moses, you are not saved. Look at verse 24. In verse 24, it says, For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls. That's what the tradition of man does. That's what all those petty, petty commandments of that man, of that woman, and then we now fear them and we're featured him before them. We even forget the words we have learned because that man, that woman has such an imposing personality. And he looks at us and he says, didn't I tell you? Forget about them. You're not brought to the church. You're not brought to the ministry to idolize any man or idolize any woman. 
or to fear man more than God. Forget about this, man or woman. It says, for as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your soul, saying, ye must be circumcised and keep the law, the law of Moses, to whom we gave no such commandment. Second Corinthians chapter 11, we're reading from verse 13. Second Corinthians 11, 13. For such a false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Verse 14 tells us, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Verse 15, it says, therefore, it is no great thing. It's no great surprise if his ministers, his servants, ministers of Satan, followers of Satan, servants of Satan, also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. In uh, Second Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 1, but there are false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privately, privately, secretly shall bring in damnable heresies. We have learned about the word that heals, the name that heals, the spirit that heals. But there are people in their former denomination, places of worship, they know what they use. Either they bring in the Psalms, seven times read this, 21 times read this, or they bring in oil, or they bring in holy water, and then they exalt all those things above the name of Christ. Christ has said, whatsoever you ask in my name, they brush all that aside. Now they are robbing the tummies of people. And there are people from the district that are going to them. Others are directing people to them. Those are the false brethren among us. Those are the people who are leading others astray. And those are the people who are telling us, drop the Bible and take the tradition of a former denomination. Where did you come? If that former denomination and their tradition and their practices are so good, you still carry them along, why didn't you stay there? Why do you come here to pollute the church of God based on the Bible? But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privately, privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. They were saved, the Lord that bought them. Now they deny the sufficiency of the Lord that bought them, and they bring upon themselves swift destruction. Look at number two there. Number two, is yeah, the courage, for conservation in faithful believers. When it says, earnestly contained for the faith, once delivered unto the saints. That one is not only at the Bible study, it's not just for the preacher or the teacher of the word, it's for you. That to start with, in the church, you're upholding the faith and the gospel was delivered unto the saints. What's your friends? If you see your friends or the closest person to you on earth is going the wrong direction, going away from the word of the gospel, that's why you are to honestly contend. You're not be smiling, embracing, error, and falsehood. Then, as a worker, 
if there's any worker that is kind of a changing the gospel, it's not living by the word of the gospel. If you are honestly contending, you'll not be smiling and patting them on the back. I say, if working for God, there's eternal security for workers. Once you're a worker, you're always a worker. Even if you are turning the gospel upside down, no, you challenge them. And if you have authority to push them aside, you push them aside. If you don't have authority to put them aside, you report them. That's honestly contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints. And then in your office, in your place of work, they journey together and they're calling people to do things contrary to the gospel. And as they defending the truth and as they contending for the faith, you'll say, count me out, I will not. Ah, you lose your job. I keep my salvation. Whatever else goes, let it go. We're honestly with courage contending for the faith, for the conservation of the faith of the gospel as faithful believers. We're looking at Galatians chapter 2 and we're reading from verse 5. In verse 5, to whom we give place by subjection, no, not for an hour. Let me ask you a question. Can you do that? to everyone that brings falsehood, deception. And there are some big men, personalities. And there are some high society women or high church women you cannot say no to. You know the truth. You know the gospel. You may hear now for a number of years and somebody, whoever, brings anything that will turn you away <clears throat> from the gospel, that will turn you away from the truth, away from the faith. Is there somebody that has such an imposing stature in your life that you cannot say no? Paul the Apostle said, and if he didn't do that, the gospel would not have come to you in his purity. He said, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour. That's the kind of life he wants us to live. Acts chapter 6, reading from verse 8. In Acts chapter 6, Verse 8, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then in verse 9, it says, Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and the Cyrenians, and the Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing was Stephen. Look at verse 10. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit, the revelation and the fervency. They were not able to resist the word and the pungency by which he spake, chapter 14, verse 1. Acts 14, verse 1, and it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews and so spake, and so spake, and so spake, they spoke with conviction. They spoke with courage. They spoke with their very life, committing their life into what they spoke. They so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews 
and also the Greeks believed verse 2 in verse 2 but the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles they stirred them up against the word which they have heard they stirred up their minds their spirit and they stirred them up in opposition against the thing they have heard and they made their minds evil affected against the brethren against the preachers and then in verse 3 it says in verse 3 long time therefore a bold day speaking boldly in the Lord they thought they'll run them out of town they thought they will muscle their mouths they thought they will silence them because of the opposition they raised up but he said, even because of the opposition and because of the contradiction of those people, it says, therefore, long time, they are both speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. That's what he expects of us. That opposition will not run us out of the ministry. Contradiction of men, arguments of men, and reactions of men. Negative reactions will not run us out of the pulpit. It says, as they resisted, the people persisted. They resisted. And the apostles and the preachers, they persisted in the word of God. Long time, therefore, abode they, speaking boldly in the Lord. I pray the Lord will grant us the same courage. I said, I pray the Lord will grant us the same courage, the same commitment, and the same conviction in Jesus' name. Acts chapter 18. In Acts chapter 18, verse 9. Acts 18, verse 9. Then speak the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak. And hold not thy peace. Verse 10. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. And if you know no man can set on you to hurt you, why are you not going out for evangelism? Why are you not going out for publicity? Why are you not going out and telling the people around, why are you so fearful? When the Lord said, fear not, and that no man will hurt you. You say amen to the promise, and don't say amen to the precept. For I have much people in this city. There are many people that belong to the Lord. They are not saved yet. In this, our city, in that, your city, and through you and through me, they will be brought in in Jesus' name. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, and he continued there. The Lord said, fear not. He continued there. The Lord said, speak my word. And he continued there one year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Look at number three here now. Number three, our consecration and continuity with focused boldness. Now, boldness has uh, different directions. Somebody can be bold or nothing. It's bold. And people, two people are fighting. 
the python doesn't concern him he doesn't know the roots or the branch of that piety is bold and it comes in there that boldness means nothing a vehicle is coming and somebody is bold and then he goes to the middle of the road expecting that those vehicles will wait for him that kind of boldness is foolish boldness deadly boldness suicide boldness but when it comes to the preaching of the word, the word of God and the word of heaven. The